to learn how to express myself better so mm-hmm. others can also understand exactly what I'm saying. Because no two persons think alike. So, so way, the way how I might say something, Ivy or Alicia might not necessarily understand it, but I know how they think now and how they express themselves. So now I can express myself in a fashion to have them understand me as well in their own different ways. So this, and I don't really usually like classes, but this is my favorite class. Oh, bravo. <laughs> because um, it's, it's small and like there's a tension to detail um, and you don't have to be focusing on 20 different individuals. It's just three persons and we have open conversations and conversations can go on and on one place to another, but I think I'm getting the best experience out of this class. I am not going to lie to you. That's I, great. I prefer this class over all my other classes. So when I do like that one time that I missed, it was unfortunate. I don't usually want to miss classes, but this class I would, I kind of look forward to come to, to like, talk and hear what others have to say. Because if we had 20 people in the class, it would be just discussion, 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 trying to understand what this person is saying, this person is saying, and it'd be all over the place. As opposed to just having two other persons than myself talk, that works much better for me. Well, the nice thing is if everybody can come, then you get to know their characters, right? Um, so you're not just responding to an argument. You're understanding how, why Ivy would think that about that person. You know what I mean? And why Alicia would think that about that. Or, um, but, but you know, when it's just one on one, I can get to know each student's character, and I can start asking questions. So, it's sort of like having office hours. And yes. having a friend come in during office hours. So this is sort of the epitome of liberal arts education. This is what you pay all that money for, yes. our small seminars. So all right. It's Thank more you. of a if it, it, it's more of a social learning atmosphere because it's just four of us, even when it's just one on one, because I know you and you know me and you know how I think to an extent. So I think, I think for me, it's better. This class is better, I would say. It forces me to communicate. Okay, good. Do you want to take more RPH? I think I might in the, in, the, in the fall. I think I might because for my psychology courses, I think I might only have one or two more classes left. And that's just going to be six credits. So I need at least 12. And I usually take 16. So I might be taking more, more of these classes. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to teach, um, I think, the legacy of ancient Greek civilization, if you want to do that one, mm-hmm. um, and world philosophies. But Mr. Beebe's teaching environmental ethics and business ethics. And I don't know what Mr. Becker's teaching, but anyway, there's a lot of choices. Um, I, I, a, I took an ethics class already for an RPH ethics class at my last school, so... Oh, okay. Um, you can see if you can get a minor then. Yeah. Or um, if your GPA is high enough, is it in the top third of the school? Yeah. Yes. Well, then, then you would get into the honors society um, after three classes in, in philosophy and four classes in religion. So um, anyway, that's it looks good. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so let's do Kant. Um, did you have a reaction to Kant? I would say I do, but it's not as detailed. Let me pull up the document that I had because I has it, I have it on my phone. Um, I re- I was reading the one Kant versus this R guy's name. I don't want to mispronounce it. Well, we got to start out with the first day, right? Okay. So that the first day is his position. That's this one. The second day is um, Kant and Rousseau. The second oh, day I... is positioning it. But we got to start out with what he thinks. 
Um, so did you? I'll, I'll let you take the lead with this one then, because I think I did the wrong reading for that one then. Well, OK. I mean, I want to, you know, usually when you scroll, it's in the opposite order. So you don't do the first thing you get to. You have to go back, right, and, and start the week. OK. Um, so the, the thing about it is, if I started scrolling so that it was just Monday, Wednesday, I just I think that would get really confusing. So the whole thing is consistent. It's just backwards, right? Um, that was that one. I messed up on that one. My apologies. Uh, OK, well, that's that's life. Um, so let's do his view of reality. Sure. All right. So you do need to, to read this. This is the document. And yeah. I've, I've made it a lot cheap, uh, easier than um, assigning you directly from his stuff. <laughs> his stuff is, is hard. So the big issue was this transition from Aristotle science to modern science, right? And so Descartes, uh, remember Aristotle said, first you look at everything in the world and then you reflect so that a wise person, the, the microcosm in their head is a reflection of what's out there. Yes. If you're wise, what you say corresponds to what's actually out there. It's called the correspondence theory. And um, when you make a decision about what to do in a particular situation, if you are wise, it is the best decision. So you are literally living the best decision. The way you live is what justice is. There's no other abstract principle, right? It is a way of life. And of course, people disagree, but that's, that's the Aristotelian point of view. Now, Descartes, if you remember, instead of looking at everything and then reflecting on what you already know, he mm -hmm. questions everything, right? He wipes he everything can. out. And then all he does is look in his brain. And then all he does is, well, even if I'm doubting everything, I'm still thinking, right? He gets to the act absolute minimum. He's completely detached from reality. He's a disembodied mind. Then he thinks of God, right? Yep. And then he comes back down. But now he looks at everything through the filter of his clear and distinct ideas. And this is what's called dualism. You split off the mind from nature. And you do that so now you can manipulate nature. You can use your reason to treat nature like silly putty. And you can engineer. Um, you know, we are in the midst of re-engineering the natural world, right? Bill Gates is re-engineering it to try and get rid of the carbon. And the Koch brothers are re-engineering it to create a ton of carbon and pull out every ounce of fossil fuel in, in the whole world. So these engineers are, are profoundly powerful and so in philosophy, you just have to figure out, well, what are they thinking? How are they thinking? And so that's how they're thinking. And then um, it's leading to very, very different views. I mean, Bill Gates' view of trying to pull carbon out of the air implies that you cannot engineer nature forever, right? There's something there that we have to respect or we're going to all die, right? Whereas the Koch brothers just keep going on as if there's nothing there, as if technology will somehow save us if it gets bad enough. But there's nothing in Descartes that would lead to one or the other of those approaches. Does that make sense? Alicia? Yes. Turn off your mic. Ah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think, Alicia, I was just sort of summering Descartes and dualism. And so today, okay. today we're doing Kant. And he also was a Newtonian. He taught Newtonian physics. 
for years, for 20 years. And before he read David Hume and he started questioning, what is it that I'm teaching? So David Hume said that when we observe something, right? We observe the pencil dropping. Um, all we observe is a material thing behaving in a material way. And so the Newtonian physics claims that there are these laws that exist and they all exist in this system of interconnected uh, logical, you know, you, we Newtonian physics is this whole system. It has the first law of thermodynamics, the second law, it has notions of causality, objectivity, universality. And David Hume just says, well, wait a second, this is just a pen. Pens are not universal. They are not necessarily true. They are not objectively connected. You can't prove any of that stuff just by observing, right? All we, all we see is associations between the pen and the falling, right? And so all we can all we can say is that it's probable, it's highly probable that if I drop this, it will fall based on the fact that every other time I've dropped it, it's fallen. But we can't say it necessarily objectively will fall because those are categories that do not exist in the things. Um, does everybody understand that? Do you understand the point? Yeah, I understand the point. Okay, so Kant says, Hume woke me from my dogmatic slumbers, okay? Kant said, I had assumed that this whole system of scientific laws was actually out there, corresponded. And now I know, so he's changing his theory. And what he's saying is that our minds, um, dang it. I usually have a pair of sunglasses here. Um, have you ever heard the expression looking at the world through rose colored glasses. Yeah. No, okay, Warren has not. Okay, so if I put on a pair of sunglasses, the world looks different, right? Does that make sense? It's just shaded differently. So what Kant says is that our reason in here filters the outside world with, uh, without our uh, knowing that at all. Our reason just leaves out certain things and allows other things in because it only allows us to observe what it is we can make sense of. So what he calls what we observe, he calls it the phenomenon, all right? He says, we have these two filters. One of them is space, one of them is time. So we filter everything through space and time. Newtonian physics had absolute space and absolute time. So all the laws of physics presuppose absolute space and time. And so Kant says that the reason why Newtonian physics works is because our minds have already filtered in only enough so that we can create this system with our logic, with our reasoning powers. And so that's, that's why um, science works. It is a construction of human reason. So he says, um, it's a priori, okay, which means before experience. Um, so the nature of reason, we only, uh, we presuppose that things do not contradict each other. Something cannot be, cannot be and not be in the same time in the same place. 
Um, okay, it's a contradiction, but that's because we filter in the phenomenon and that's true of the phenomenon. Um, all right, so let's see. So he divided, this is, this is kind of complicated. So all I want to say is that he divided reality into two parts. He said, the way we experience the natural world is phenomena. And we take that phenomena and we formulate it into a body of scientific laws. And that's what the Newtonian system is. The Newtonian system is about phenomena. It's about the way human reason experiences the world. Now, we have every reason to think that we don't know everything, right? And so what it is that might, all, everything else that might be out there, he calls noumena, okay? There's the things in themselves, the noumena, and the things as we experience them. Um, all right, anybody have a question on that? I mean, ha haven't you ever as a kid imagined, well, what if I had a sixth sense? Or what if, you know, I what if I could, what does the eagle see that I don't see? Or what does uh, something else hear that I don't hear? But what if I had a sixth sense or a seventh sense? What if, you know, the whole world would be very different. Um, but we only have what we have so that we can create this body of scientific laws. Um, my, yeah, but my only question, like I tried to, I don't know much about Kant, but I've read about like his moral imperative. Yes. Um, and how he established like what, a, how a person can decide what a moral law is. Right. So how does, how, how does this connect to that? Right. Well, let's start out with reality. Okay. Remember, we did that with Descartes. First, you have yeah, really okay. have to understand how he thinks of reality. And then Descartes said, I will only act on clear and distinct ideas. Remember that? Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's what we're going to do with Kant, right? Okay. Okay. And, and it all does fit together. It's it, the argument hangs together. It just has about 25 uh, pieces to it. And so you do need to raise your hand as soon as you get lost um, because Kant was a logician, you know, it all works. It's just that it's a long proof. So, okay. By dividing reality into two, he does say then that the way we experience phenomena, we know it necessarily. So we can bring back the notion of necessity, causality, objectivity, universality, because those are true of phenomena, not noumena. We don't know what the noumena are. And then he makes an analogy with Copernicus. Because again, he's teaching modern physics. Copernicus, everybody was assuming that the earth was at the center and then told him he had these very complicated um, orbits. But then Copernicus said, well, let's just put the sun at the center and everything got simpler, right? He's saying that Aristotle assumed that, that our minds, uh, corresponded to the outside world. Do you remember when Descartes said my previously, I made this judgment that what I was observing was actually out there and now I'm totally questioning that. It's the same with Kant. He says, we previously thought that, Aristotle kept saying that. And now I'm saying it's not true. Actually everything we talk about the outside world is really our experience of the phenomenon. So instead of the center being out there, the center of is in here, okay? Very similar to Descartes in that sense. Um, all right, let's see, the nature of scientific laws. So it is true that a pen 
is not universally true or necessarily exists. We have internally consistent, objective, you know, cause effect. That's all superimposed on this poor little old pen, right? It's just a piece of plastic and it's going to end up in a, in a, uh, what dump site someday um, and probably be toxic, whatever. Um, but anyway, none of those, none of that logical internally consistent system you could say is actually true of this pen, you know? There's no way to get there, but it's true of the phenomenon of the pen, the way we experience it. Okay. So, um, so then he's, he has reclaimed science. He says he has made science legitimate, Newtonian science, because he's limited what we know about. So he says, um, I've reclaimed science. I've legitimized it by limiting its scope. Then he says, there's still these other questions that reason cannot answer. Why is there anything at all? Um, what do the laws of reason apply to and what don't they apply to? What's the relation between the phenomena and the noumena? What is the noumena? Does the human soul exist? Is it immortal? And does free will exist? We can't answer, our reason cannot answer that question. All it is our reason understands is phenomena. Now, is it more reasonable to conclude that there exists a God who created the universe than to deny it? And because the phenomena is not self-creating, right? We're back, or self-generating or self-sustaining, right? The laws are universal, but the phenomena they refer to are not, right? They aren't self-creating, self-sustaining anything. So it's more reasonable to think that there is a God that created it, right? Created the phenomenon. Reason wants to know the cause and cannot answer the question from what it knows about phenomena, but it's more reasonable to believe in God and in the soul. It's it's reasonable to believe that your soul has a noumena and it's not, you are not just the phenomena. And it's more reasonable to think that you have free will and that you are immortal. And I will explain all of that in just a minute. Um, for this lecture, for this section, does it make sense that he says, it's reasonable, it's more reasonable to think there's a God that caused all of this than to deny it, right? He is option, it's the way you do um, the proofs like math, either A or not A, right? Either God exists or does not. Well, it's not reasonable to think that there's no cause Therefore, it's more reasonable to think there's a cause and that's what God is. So reason will make room for faith, right? Um, any questions on that? No. Okay. It's, it's not I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, it actually makes sense when you put it that way. Um, because you cannot okay a proof is used to demonstrate something is real or is not real and there's not a proof to show that god is not the cause so if you reason that god is not the cause you have to come up with a different cause which once again you cannot prove well you yeah i mean there's every reason to think the phenomena had to have had a cause but yeah, your yeah. but your reason has no way of understanding that right does that make sense so yeah. so the thing here here's the the major difference between 
Aristotle, Augustine, no, Aristotle and Aquinas versus Augustine, Descartes, and Kant. For Aristotle and Aquinas, you could actually prove there, there is a first foundation, God, because there's a there's the prior actuality of everything else in the world. So you just make an analogy. God exists as a pure actuality. God exists as the self-caused cause. God exists. So that was a kind of knowledge of God that you could have through your reason, because that's the old view of reason. But now, if you focus on math and you focus on Newtonian physics, that view of reason will never get you to any knowledge. It's just faith, okay? Um, does that make sense to people? Okay? Yes. <clears throat> okay, because in the modern world, the relation between science and faith becomes a lot more problematic and fraught, right? Uh, controversial and all that stuff. And this is one reason that the dualists, right, the rationalists, it's a view of reason that we are now going to put at the forefront of the culture. Um, the, there's two, do, there's two um, major models for reason after the modern world. One of them is math, is the dualists. And then starting next week, we do the empiricists. It's just data. Okay. The ancient view was final causes. You always think about the good. Everything is seeking its perfect state. Um, all right. So for now we've got the God exists. Now let's go to the next one. The next one is the ethics. All right. Um, so given reason consists in this activity of creating scientific laws, okay? When reason is turned toward the natural world, we take our concepts of space and time and then we apply these concepts of universality, objectivity, logic, consistency, identity, non-contradiction. We take all that, that's the filter. And then we just gather more and more data of phenomena, right? We gather more and more data, we fit them into our system. But the, the activity of reasoning is the activity of running phenomena uh, through the reason shredding machine. The reason machine, it, it's the mechanistic worldview. It's a machine. It's this huge system. Um, okay, let's see. All right, and we superimpose this mechanical system. This, you know, you can see we're going toward computers, right? Uh, it's the mechanistic worldview. It's making the world into a machine. It's God as the clockmaker that wound it up, you know, designed this machine and sort of cranked it up. Okay. Um, all right. Then here's the here's the next one. Um, it's excuse me. If if human beings here's a it's an indirect proof. Let me just ask you before. I, you know, I won't give you the cheat sheet. You have to figure this out. If all I am is a phenomena, if all I am is a body, right? Then all those laws of nature apply to me, right? Every single thing I do is I necessarily, I do it um, by the causality involved is necessary it's objective, it's universal, it um, fits into a system. And that would make, that would destroy moral responsibility because you just say, I'm functioning according to those necessary laws of nature, just like the pen, right? Um, is, that, is that the way we think? 
I don't think so. I don't, that's not the way I think. If we were just phenomena, we would have, we would not be morally responsible for our behavior. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. Okay. Now, the next step is that how does our reason work? Is that the way we think about ourselves? Or do we actually think that we have choice? Right? Have you ever told yourself, I really want to do this, but I really ought to do that. Have you ever said I ought not to do that? Yeah. Ah, so he's saying that in your head by nature, right? You have a consciousness of choice, of options. And um, so we have a consciousness of ourselves as being the reason, uh, okay, so the science, we're, we're creating this body of laws and we're thinking rationally. And then we also know that our bodies are phenomena. We get hungry. We can't defy the law of gravity. We get scared. We react to the outside world just the way an animal would react, right? We know that. But so we know ourselves as both rational and physical okay everybody got that yes all right but if we're motivated by emotions only we're not morally responsible right oh i did that because i was angry um all right and and kant calls that inclination when you're motivated just by the same sort of drives that animals are that's your inclination but we're conscious of ourselves as having pure reason, a priori, right? It's pure. It's not tainted by experience that we impose on the world. So if we're able to create a body of laws to understand the natural world, and then we also are always telling ourselves, you ought not to do this. You really ought to do that. Where did we get that idea of ought, right? Well, we got that from our reason. The very fact that we can conceive of ourselves as following a moral law, right? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. Kant says the Ten Commandments are sort of rudimentary. Those people long ago had this vague idea of reason, right? And it's just now with the Enlightenment, we can be very self-consciously aware and we can create a system of moral laws because we, we consciously think like that. We give ourselves these laws, right? That's our reason at work. That's our consciousness that we have a choice. And the very fact that you can be motivated by the concept of a moral law means that you have free will because you can be motivated by, okay, say, am I going to lie about um, uh, why I missed class last, last time, right? I just screwed up. I mean, I just didn't want to, didn't want to come, but I'm not going to tell the teacher that, right? Um, so can I lie, right? I want to lie. My inclination tells me I want to lie because I don't want Dr. Beck to feel bad and just think I'm blowing the class. I don't like the class. So, so you have to decide, am I really going to lie or am I going to tell the truth, right? So, and then the next thing, you know that the moral law says you shall not lie, right? Because why? We have this concept that we have a choice. I ought to do this, but I want to do that. That means you have a will. The consciousness of having a choice is what free will is, right? And so we can conceive of ourselves as having a noumena, as being more than just a phenomena. And we can conceive of ourselves as having a choice choosing according to a moral law or choosing according to inclination. 
therefore it's more reasonable to think we actually have a free will and we have this noumena, right? And we can choose and we should choose to follow the moral law because that's reason is what gives us infinite worth and dignity. That's what elevates us above the animals. That's what elevates, that, that's what makes us different. We have inclinations, but then we're just like an animal. It's our reason that gives us infinite worth and dignity. Um, so it's possible for us both to think we're free and that we're not free. Our phenomenal self is not free, but it's reasonable to think that we are also a noumenal self that's not subject to the laws of science and that gives itself a moral law. Um, let's see, it's clear to reason that in every case of making a decision, we can come become aware of what our inclination would want to do and what our reason, the moral law that reason would require. And reason would demand it. You, you have to do it if you want to follow reason. Um, in every case, and I just have a couple minutes, so let me just scroll through the outline and we'll just start on Friday. We'll start right about here with your questions. So why don't you start writing down questions right now and then we'll start the next class with that. But anyway, so, the, so we have free will. Now we can use it to choose inclination or to choose to follow the moral law. A good will by definition is the choice to follow the moral law without any inclination, without thinking about consequences, just do it because reason requires it, that's it. Um, and a good will is more important than intelligence or wealth because you can use your intelligence to make money or pleasure or whatever. The thing that really gives you dignity is to have a good will, is to be determined to follow the moral law in everything that you do. Um, it shines forth because it has infinite worth, even when nobody else knows that that's the reason you're doing it, even when the consequences don't necessarily turn out pleasant. The fact that you act on the good will because it's the moral law is what gives it ultimate worth. There's no other ulterior motive. Um, okay, it's not good based, you don't consider consequences, you think of the motive for doing this. Um, okay, we ought to use our reason. Then once we realize that we have to create a body of moral laws that is analogous to the body of scientific laws that are universally applicable and consistent. The trouble is they will never be necessarily true because people have choice, right? You, there could be the right thing to do, which is right for everybody in the situation and you ought to do it, but you still don't do it. So it's not necessarily true and it's not objectively true because of this power of choice. Um, all right, because they're not necessarily true, they're framed as commands, you ought to do it. Whereas in science, the pen will drop, right? But in morals, you can't say, you will not lie, that's not true. You ought not to lie, right? Um, all right, and this, a categorical impairment and imperative is it's absolutely true. It is the right thing to do. It's universally true, whether or not you do it. If you don't do it, you're wrong, that's it. Um, okay, the first principle, every choice you make has to include, you never act in a way, um, it has to be universally applicable. So whenever you say, what if everybody did that, right? Everything you do, you have to think, this is what everybody should do. It's not just about me. 
and also everything you do, you should always respect other human beings as ends in themselves. So when you go to cash out at the cash register, you don't treat the cashier just as a means to your own ends. You treat the cash cashier as a human being with dignity. And then you happen to have this relation, but the person also has infinite worth. Um, let's see, sometimes people are motivated by goodwill and they still suffer. And that's why it's reasonable to believe in immortality and ultimate reward for your efforts or punishment for your acting on inclination, right? So it's more reasonable to think we naturally want things to make sense. And we it's reasonable to think we have a noumena. It's reasonable to think we have free will. And it's reasonable to think ultimately we will be there's eternal life where the injustices of this world are resolved right so this is his conclusion he's preserved the validity of necessary scientific laws he's established the real reasonableness of belief in god he's preserved the belief in free will in the face of a scientific method that could deny it He's preserved a belief in the immortality and all of the positions are based on his model of reason and what it knows and doesn't know and what it's reasonable to believe. And he's limited the scope of reason to make room for this new understanding. So it's a new understanding based of God, freedom and immortality with this split between the phenomena our experience of, of the world as rational beings and the noumena, right? Which it's reasonable for us to think exists and is important. Um, all right, does everybody sort of have the foundation there? Yes. yes. And, and then we will start, first of all, with your questions, and then we'll start, well, how do you educate a kid? That's the psychology. If you thought this, how would you habituate your child? And then also on this, the, the same day, I also have four examples. What about committing suicide? What about telling a lie? What about not developing your talents? And so he would ask himself, can you will this to be a universal law of nature? Um, and he will come, he comes to the conclusion that it's absolutely unthinkable. And so we'll get to that. Um, it's just, that's where we're going. And then for Friday also, you can read those examples in the, the next uh, class, right? Do, does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's great. Um, next time we'll have more student input. Mm -hmm. I think Kant is the most difficult to understand. And that's why I think you have to talk it through. But okay. once, once you get it, I think you can get it. Okay? Because you guys can get it. Okay. Problem. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.